Jack! I guess you're booking this, you had questions for me. Jack, Jack O'Hara. Boy, you asked me some interesting questions, my man. Jack, hey, it's Josh Ryder. Hey there, Jack O'Hara, it's Johnny Damon. Jack O'Hara, absolutely. What's up, Jack? Well, Jack, you know, that's some good questions, Jack. Hey, Jack, how you doing? Hello, man? Bob Sackett, how's it going, man? Jack, hey, what's going on, man? What's going on, Jack? Uh, listen, man, you know, you, you you asked me a couple questions. Hey, Jack, right? That's right, man. Hey, Jack. Jack O'Hara. Anybody call you, John? It is another edition of the O Show podcast, live from Las Vegas. Yep. Walk with me, buddy. everybody welcome back to the o show this is episode 355 of the podcast want to give a special shout out to the brook and the bluff for coming on the show last week great guys out of nashville tennessee going back out on tour for their u.s tour starting next month starting in nashville but they'll be out here in phoenix i think october 11th is the exact date hope to have those guys in the studio uh come the fall but today we have david Meltzer on the show he's the co-founder of sports one marketing he's also the executive producer of bloomberg and amazon television series two minute drill also the executive producer of entrepreneurs number one digital business show elevator pitch he's also featured in many books movies tv so tv shows such as uh, the world's greatest motivators think and grow rich which is the legacy and beyond secret which is also airing on netflix his life mission is to empower over one billion people to be happy, which is the most important thing. This simple yet powerful mission has led him on an incredible journey to provide one thing, which is value to the customer and all of his content and communication. That's exactly what you'll receive. And for the past 20 years, David has been providing free weekly trainings to empower, to empower others uh, to be happy. So today we have David Meltzer on the show. This is episode 355. We did this interview two days ago via Zoom. So I hope you enjoy. Hey, how are you? Good. How are you? Thanks so much for doing this, man. Oh, are you kidding me? Anytime. Thank you for having me. Well, I won't take too much of your time. I know uh, you got a busy day, busy schedule, of course, as always. But I, I was very excited to, you know, set up a time to talk to you about certain things, you know, your experiences in business, you know, both ups and downs and everything you got going on. But first, I kind of wanted to touch on, you know, you have those um, the, the, the free Friday uh, training sessions that you do. It's going to be every Friday at 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific time. What exactly, you know, do you want people to take away from that? Like, what are your, like, biggest goals that you want people to accomplish, you know, learning from, you know, your past and current experiences? Yeah, so I've been doing them for over 20 years, and they started in sales trainings, and they've moved to an eclectic group of trainings of teaching people how to make more money, help more people, and have more fun, which is how I define happiness. And not only can they come live, there's over... I think, you know, 43,000 people that have registered for trainings on Friday now, which is up from the four people I started with. Uh, but even moreover, uh, all the replays of the trainings are available as a podcast. So I have uh, one of the top podcasts called The Playbook. One day a week are the replays of the trainings. To tell you how popular they are, though, although I have billionaires, millionaires, entrepreneurs, celebrities, athletes, and entertainers. Right. Everyone from Karen, Cameron Diaz to Maria Sharapova to Danica Patrick, to, you name it, it's been on the podcast. My trainings are the number one downloaded podcast of all the ones that I do. So I really encourage people, if you want to make money, help people have fun, you want to learn how to be happy, uh, my trainings, whether you come to them live at 11 a.m. on Fridays or watch the replays on the playbook, you can't beat it. I, they're free. My book's always free. I'm happy. As you know, David at dmelter.com. I'll sign it. Ebook. Uh, audio book or ship it and sign it. I'll pay for it. Don't worry. I'll pay for shipping. Don't worry. Uh, but I'm here to empower over a billion people to be happy. That's how I do it. Yeah. I mean, I got my signed free copy as well. I mean, thank you for that. You know, it, it's amazing to see, you know, you taking your experiences and your knowledge to be able to, again, spread and, and help others kind of create their own paths, whether it is, you know, getting into the business that they want to pursue or at the same time, kind of, you know, kind of, learn from their mistakes in that sense so like for you growing up I kind of wanted to pick your brain about you know you know your driving force that chip on your shoulder so to speak as to why it is what you wanted to do growing up was it you know again because the early on experiences I feel like kind of shaped that mentality early on what was it for you uh, that kind of shaped that mentality for you to want to make as much money as you did in business and other adventures that you had 
Sure. It was my mom. You know, I had a single mom. My dad left when I was five, six kids. She worked two jobs. She packed my dinner in a paper bag, never complained. Uh, all my siblings went to the Ivy League. She instilled not only great work ethic, but also study ethic. She also just ethics in general of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration to be the best that we could be, to have the desire that we must be what we can be. But I just wanted to be rich for one reason from the time I was five. I wanted to buy my mom a house and a car. I lived with six kids in a two bedroom apartment in Akron, Ohio, and I wanted better for my mom. I never had a car my entire childhood that didn't break down, that I wasn't embarrassed of being inside uh, and, you know, always caused pain, financial stress, the house, the car, food, those three primary things. I wanted to be, well, when I was five, I wanted to be a millionaire. I wanted to buy my mom a house, a car and retire on a million dollars. Not a bad plan. <laughs> yeah, it I worked though. That. I did it. I did it, but it didn't retire me. That was the problem. I did buy my mom a house and a car though. So that was good. Wow. So, you know, how, because that's a very, you know, tough thing to kind of put on yourself in that sense of like, yes, like these experiences that you're having are kind of shaping that mentality early on. But at the same time, it's got to be in your own head as well. You know, like insecurities that you had, like within yourself that kind of form that. How, you know, because later on in life, you, you look back at everything and think like, man, I probably would have done that differently. Looking back at it now, like, what would you say to your, you know, younger self when you looked at some of the both big decisions that you made and some of the big mistakes that you made? Yeah, I think there's three main things that I would look at. One, money doesn't buy love or happiness. Yeah. So it allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things, you can be happy. But if you're buying things you don't need to impress people you don't like, you're in big trouble. And I got into big trouble that way. Um, the second thing was, is I'm not responsible for everyone else. Yeah. You know, that was, like you said, I, I got emotional when you said, well, that's a lot to put on yourself. Uh, I have a big, you know, problem with feeling, you know, the puppy dog syndrome that I'm responsible for everyone, that I can help everyone just because I can help everyone uh, in that way to put myself into a detriment or diminished capacity to help other people. Um, and then the third one is simply ask for help. You know, not only was money buying love and happiness, not only did I feel responsible for everybody, but I felt like I had to do it by myself. Uh, and the most valuable lesson, the thing I would tell my 13 year old, 23, 33, 43, and now I'm 53 year old self. And I still tell myself is, hey, live with radical humility. Easiest way to get to where you want to be is find someone that's in that situation. Ask them for directions, ask them for help you'll get there a lot faster, a lot easier and leverage the networks of others as much as you leverage yours. You are not responsible for anyone. Money doesn't buy love or happiness. And most importantly, ask for help. Do you think that stems down from, you know, family members and stuff? Cause I did recently listen to an interview that it, you did a few years ago on uh, the passionate view, you know, early on in that one, you were talking about, you know, your rocky relationship with your father for, you know, throughout the first 20, 30 years of your life and you, was, you were talking about, you know, how he bought you a jacket on your 30th birthday and how he cut the holes in it. Um, you know, it's your story to tell. So I'll let you kind of elaborate on that, but you know, what exactly, you know, do, do you take away from that? And what exactly did he mean by like, you can't take anything with you in this sense? Like you're never going to wear this jacket because you can't take anything with you. Yeah. My dad was concerned. I was just like him. Uh, but of course, like every other 30 year old, that was a multimillionaire that thinks they know more than they know without living and without having radical humility, you know, I felt like my dad was constantly attacking me, that he was judging me, that he thought he was better than me. He never told me he was proud of me. And so when he gave me a jacket to teach me a lesson that money doesn't buy love or happiness, he tore all the lining out, all the pockets out to have me buried in that jacket, meaning uh, I couldn't take anything with me when I was gone, that money couldn't buy love or happiness, that I would hang it in my closet to remind me I was just like him, that you know, I couldn't be the richest man in the cemetery. Well, I wasn't ready to hear it. You know, it's not what people say, it's what you hear. All I heard was he was attacking me. He wasn't proud of me, that I was disappointing in him, that I was a liar, a cheater, an overseller, a back end seller, a manipulator like him. And to this day, you know, when I became friends with my dad later on in my life, and my dad had great qualities and he had some really shitty ones. And I learned from both and I appreciate both and I appreciate my father uh, for who he was and what I, uh, his intention was and, and what he taught me. Uh, but that was the greatest lesson that he taught me because 
when push came to shove later on in my life, and I was about to throw away everything and probably throw away my life, two years before I lost everything even, I lost over $100 million. Two years before that, I was about to throw away everything. And that jacket saved my life because for whatever reason, that's what I saw when I was going to throw it all away. And I looked at it and I realized I don't hate my life. I don't hate my father. I don't hate my wife. I don't hate my friends. I hate myself. I'm the liar, the cheater, the manipulator, overseller, back end seller. And I better do something about it. I better take stock in who I was, learn what values I have and create daily practices to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. And that's what I did. And it changed my life. Do you think he kind of learned the same ways, you know, later on in life? Because again, you said that you didn't really have a good relationship with your father until, you know, the later years. Do you think that, you know, because obviously you're a father in your own right, you know, like you, you raise kids as well and you didn't have that rela- relationship with him and you've obviously learned from that. But like looking back at it in his perspective almost, do you feel like he learned from his mistakes when it came to being a businessman and being like cocky and arrogant in, in, in that regard? It's so interesting. No one's ever asked me that. Um, The difference between my father and I is that I learned to illuminate the lessons I've learned. And he still was in at least public denial. I think his ego, he hadn't done as much work with humility and his ego. I think he learned, he's an extremely intelligent guy. Uh, I think he learned the lessons, but was too afraid to tell people that he learned them. So he had his bravado, his ego, uh, it, and it appeared, I, th- I don't think he was in denial. I think he was very cognizant and aware of the mistakes and the lessons that he learned. But I don't think where he got to the point of, of radical humility to be completely vulnerable. You know, my dad never told me he was proud of me. My dad never admitted, you know, to me, uh, other than that jacket, that in any way he regretted anything in his life uh, or that he had learned things beyond the money doesn't buy happiness when I was 30 and he told me I was worried. I don't know if it's because I rejected him or because he became in competition with me or if he just, you know, hadn't reached that level of awareness to be radically humble. But uh, I do, I think he learned the lessons. He just never articulated them uh, or was vulnerable with them with me or the other kids. Yeah. I feel like it was a different time back then too. Like you never really like admitted your mistakes. It was almost weak to in, in that regard. Yeah. I mean, it's just like dad's hugging you or telling you they're proud of you. You know, my mom was extremely supportive. Uh, It's just a different time and different culture, different expectations. I mean, women, when my mom went to college, one of the saddest things my mom ever told me, you know, my mom was a great teacher, an elementary school teacher. She worked two jobs. She filled up turnstiles after school, uh, putting greeting cards and turnstiles at convenience stores just so we could eat. But what my mom told me one day was, that you know she could have been a doctor, but women were teachers or nurses, they weren't doctors. And that all the boys, she went to Ohio State and graduated top of her class, uh, you know, straight A student like my siblings. Uh, but what made me really sad is there's all these rich doctors and lawyers and businessmen who cheated off my mom, you know, to get through school. And here my mom was, we were literally on food stamps and the guys driving around in the big cars with the big houses, had to cheat off my mom to get through school, but they didn't let women, you know, pursue those types of careers or they weren't expected to, or else you were completely outside of the norm. So those were the sad stories that I learned and make me even, you know, I think be more grateful and respectful of my mom. So obviously like you've taken away these experiences and have learned from them and are very open about them. You know, you share them, you know, on all your platforms, whether it be social media, business, whatever. You know, from your regard, again, like being there for, you know, both your mom and your dad, good, bad, worse and different, you know, what do you, when did you kind of realize that like, okay, they're learning from those mistakes in that sense, because you're very open about, you know, when you went bankrupt and you had to earn it all the way back. Like when, you know, in your perspective, did you think like, okay, this is when my dad learned from this. Is this when my mom learned from this? Yeah. For me, it was when I wrote my first book, Connected to Goodness, the one that I sent you and we're happy to send anyone else. Uh, so when I started, it's amazing how much I blacked out, you know, and, and it was cathartic and painful, illuminating and vulnerable when I wrote, especially section one of the book, uh, which tells my story. 
And it took me a long time to tell that story because I kept remembering things. You know, it's, it's amazing, you know, the pain that we block out in order to survive, right? And the mistakes that we make when you have a survival energy, thank you that you have to lie, cheat, manipulate, oversell, back end sell to get what you want. All these things came forward. You know, even, you know, here's something that was weird. I'm writing my book, you know, and, you know, I'm in my 40s, so I'm not a young guy. I'm writing my book. My dad's still alive. And I think to myself, my dad never cried. I've never seen, I'm a crybaby, as you know, you listen to my interviews, right? I, I cry, you know, I'm just connected to my feelings. I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, and my dad never cried. And so I go to bed that night. I'm thinking my dad never cried. And in my sleep, I see myself leaving Akron, Ohio as a nine-year-old to move to San Diego with my siblings. My father is still in Akron and my mom is leaving with all his children and he's, you know, complete train wreck. He has a girlfriend closer to my age than his. He's, re he's not supporting us financially, right? And he's arrogant. He has ego problems. Well, anyway, I now remember at 40 something years old, writing my book after thinking my dad's never cried, I'm walking on the airplane. I'm sad. I'm leaving my dad. Even though we weren't, weren't that close, um, I was still at nine. I still loved him and he was still my hero. I turn around to say goodbye. And for the first time in 30 years, I see him crying. Wow. I blocked it out for 30 some years because it was so painful that I still get choked up today thinking about it. That one of the things that bugged me about my dad is he didn't care about me. He wasn't proud of me. How could he let me go to Ohio without him? Why didn't he fight? How could he not be sad? But he did. He's, it broke his heart. And as a father, like you know what that must feel like, right? You, you couldn't even imagine to, to have your children leave you, right? No matter what your relationship with the, them are. I know what it was like when my kids went to college. I had to fight back because I know it was better for them. You know, now I don't want them to come back. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> but I tell them every day that I'm proud of them. I love them, appreciate them. I always learn lessons and do their best. But yes, uh, those are the things that come out. And it's remarkable how our mind protects us uh, from real pain. Oh, yeah. Did, did your kids uh, go far for college? So, uh, so far, the one graduated Tulane University where I went to law school. So we live in Southern California. So that's halfway across the country. And the other one went to Indiana, uh, which is East Coast. Yeah. Uh, so I think the third one's going to stay close by USC or San Diego State or Stanford or somewhere. But uh, the first two left uh, to go away. And my wife is, you know, I didn't go anywhere they want, but my wife is uh, very encouraging about leaving for college to experience somewhere else even if you want to come back uh she's fine with that uh, as long as you come back and live somewhere else no kidding <laughs> you can live next door but not in her house she always says you can come over we'll feed you we'll take care of you but go home to go to bed and make a mess in your own home my wife is convinced by the way with this i've never been said on the interview but my wife she tells me this michael my kids will see this that her biggest revenge is when they uh, grow up and have kids get married that she's going to literally go to their house and mess up their entire house on purpose. <laughs> she's going to go leave all the food out. She's going to leave her shoes or clothes. She's not going to clean the bathroom. At any chance she gets, she's going to screw up their house. So I'm just warning them right now. <laughs> that's how, hey, that's how I felt 20 <laughs> years raising you kids. That's how it's going to be. That's you get it. Yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> that's so funny that's how it's done though like me i grew up in new jersey the new york new jersey area and i went to school out in phoenix arizona you know yeah. like get out of your comfort zone you know go experience something else that's how you're gonna grow right yeah i'm glad i'm glad i left as well to go to graduate school because i did go to college in la and you know it was two hours away but big difference when i went to tulane wow so we don't have a ton of time i know uh, you got a busy schedule but i wanted to ask you one more question because it kind of you know relates to you, you carved 20 minutes out of your day to talk to me you're, you're very you know big on you know setting your schedule getting or you know carving out enough time to accomplish as many things that you want to in a 24-hour period so i guess my question there is 
you know, what is your, you know, specific plan and how much does it evolve for you, you know, planning stuff out so you're able to, again, get those things done in a timely manner while at the same time giving back to others like you're doing for me right now? Yeah, so for me, being a student in my calendar is effectuating the mathematical equation of luck. I pay attention to and give attention to the coincidences I want with the activity I planned, the activity I don't have planned, and even my sleep. My tomorrow starts today. I actually start my day with an unwinding routine to put myself into a pure form of recovery, consciously, subconsciously, and unconsciously. Uh, but even more importantly, I utilize the lens of productivity by studying those things. So I'm studying how productive I can be, how much value I can bring. So I have a 520 rule where I try to keep every single phone call to five minutes, every interview meeting to 20 minutes. I also utilize the lens of accessibility. So I'm really intentional about being accessible to as many people as I can, like you in this interview, but also accessing what I want meaning time with my family, time for my health, time to have activity I get paid for as well. And then, of course, most importantly, a lot of my time and attention and intention is spent on the lens of gratitude. See, gratitude is a superpower. It allows me to find the light, the love, and the lessons and everything. It allows me to learn to love the activity I get paid for, learn to love the activity I don't get paid for. I believe that there's light, love, and lessons in every single thing. Some things naturally, like baseball for you and me, we love just naturally. But other things like taking out the trash or doing the dishes or you know other things, we have to learn to love it, but you can. You can use Viktor Frankl's meaning, man's meaning, uh, search of meaning, to effectuate whatever you do. And so I use the superpower of productivity, accessibility, and gratitude to seek what I want in everything because I give meaning to everything that I see. I hope that everyone reaches out to me, david at dmeltzer.com. I, as you know, will give my ebook, my audio book. I'll sign a book. I'll pay for shipping. I'll pay for it for you. david at dmeltzer.com. Those five daily practices I'll send to you, know your what, your where, your how, your now, and your why. David at dmelter.com. But most importantly, Jack, I appreciate you. And remember, everyone, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. And so again, much. like, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to talk to me. I mean, from everything that you've experienced in your life to, you know, give back to all these people to want to interact with everybody that follows you and has followed your, you know, experiences in business and in life. You know, I, I truly appreciate it. Blaine, thanks for setting this up, man. And I wish you guys both the best of luck in your future. We'll send you some content as well. Thank you. Talk Thank you, you very much once again to David Meltzer for taking time out of your day to talk to me here on episode 355. Remember, you can buy his book, Connected to Goodness, as well as Compassionate Com uh, Capitalism. Uh, on Amazon, you catch the video version of this podcast on YouTube as well as StarWorldWideNetworks.com and the audio version on iTunes and Spotify. We have Michael Goodman in studio next week here on episode 361 of the podcast. Until then, this is episode 355 of The O Show. Thanks for watching. <laughs>